The problem office has, if you think about it, is the economy has added jobs net versus pre-COVID. And in a period when the economy has net added jobs, office has fallen apart, right? right? It's not that office had trouble when we were in early COVID and nobody was there. That's what do you expect, right? right? The disturbing part is even as we've net added jobs, it's still weak. I just don't think we're that different than most people. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Let's focus for two seconds about where we're having this conversation. So before we dive into recession, interest rates, the Fed, commercial real estate, Peter, why don't you just for two seconds give people a sense of the historic importance oh, of this sure. spot? This is amazing. I mean, if we think we're living in tough times, uh, just not so long ago in 1776, they declared two blocks from here. We aren't part of England anymore. And a seven-year war began. You think those were tough times? And there's a cement, there's a park across the street from us, um, Washington Square, that has 3,000 unknown dead buried under it from that era. Um, so it's always a tough time. But two blocks from here, for those of you who don't know, um, is Independence Hall in all its glory. We're in Constitution Center. Both Independence Hall was the host of both the Declaration of Independence and then subsequently the Constitution. And for eight, uh, for six of Washington's eight years, he was president about a, two blocks from here. Uh, in Robert Morris's house, who was the financier of the deck of the uh, Independence War, and um, Congress was also here for six years. And I encourage you to come and see Congress Hall for two reasons. One, you go, oh my God, we used to fit the whole government in that building. That would be a nice step forward if we did that today. <laughs> and the other is it's where the upper house comes from, because when you go there physically, you see that the House of Representatives was on the lower floor and Senate was on the upper floor and you get a great sense of how they viewed themselves differentially. So welcome to Philadelphia. Nice to be here. So you start this quarterly Lineman letter, Peter, with <laughs> the question of, will we have a recession? And I read that and I said to myself, well, I don't know what world Peter or other people in the commercial real estate industry are living in, but it really feels like we've been in a recession, if not a depression, as it relates to commercial real estate yeah. for the last two or three quarters since the Fed started raising rates. And I was asked by Barron's last week in an interview I did, they said, are we headed towards a recession? I said, quite honestly, we've already been in the midst of this storm for quite some time in commercial real estate. So really a recession or no recession doesn't have that much impact. With that said, what's your take on are we headed to a recession? Well, if you talk about it as the economy, look, you know, go back during World War II, we were at war, but not everybody was in war. Not even everybody in the military was always in war, in combat, if you will. And, and there's certainly sectors that are in combat, right? And, and parts of commercial. The office sector has been in combat, real combat, for three years now, right? And it's maybe not getting worse, but it's also not getting a lot better in office. Um, and then anybody who borrowed floating or borrowed short term, they're in a very difficult situation. Um, and, um, and that's because the Fed has declared war on the economy. Um, it's kind of crazy what they've done, but they've done it. And um, will the economy in abroad, though, be in recession? I don't think so. We still have like 68% of all the industries in the United States adding jobs. And it may not be our business that's adding jobs, but 68% of all the industries are adding jobs. And that's not like a funny number. It's a real kind of indicative number. Um, we're adding lots of jobs still. Um, uh, we added over 200,000 jobs last month. Um, I said that we live in a bizarre world. Do you want a sense of how bizarre the world we live in is? If the job numbers last week had come out minus 500,000 jobs, that we lost 500,000 jobs last month, everybody in America would be really unhappy, upset, except nine people. The Fed would be thrilled. And if we came out last month and we said 500,000 jobs were added, 
everybody in America would be really happy except nine people. That shows you how screwed up the economics are. Really does. It's a very simple, uh, oversimplified situation. So you say in this in the letter that inflation is dead. Today, we got a, a, a minor uptick month on month of 10 basis points of inflation. Uh, year on year, we're still up about 5%. Yeah. Talk for a moment, Peter, about looking at it on a year on year basis versus on a month to month basis okay. and why they're, why going back in the rearview mirror is an incorrect calculus. It's a difference between, you know, all of you accelerated your car from zero to 50 miles an hour. So if I look back and I looked at the change in your speed, it's quite dramatic. But now you're going like 50, 51, 53, 50. That's what's going on. It's that simple. So a year ago, the world was still incredibly screwed up from COVID. And it's what I've called uh, economic long COVID. Right? We know about the physical long COVID. We have economic long COVID. The things that we did to our economies, not just the U.S., but throughout the U.S., around the world, they don't go away like that, right? You don't shut down businesses and not have some long-lasting effects. You don't have um, uh, people not allowed to travel or get elective surgery for months on end without some long-lasting effects. We're living through those long-lasting effects, whether it's inflation, whether it's the lag in jobs. All of those are happening they're working their way through. So what happened was if you compare us to a year ago, yes, prices are up. But if you compare us to the six months ago, over the last six months, we're running about two, two and a quarter percent inflation on an annualized basis. That's the car is accelerated already. And now it's kind of bouncing between 50, 51, 52, 53 back down. That's where we're at. So today's number, last everybody can do this math. Okay, follow me. Last month, um, inflation uh, prices on average were one tenth of one percent higher than the previous month. So if I said annualize that, well, you have to exponentiate. And you say, well, that's too complicated. I don't know how to do that. Multiply by twelve. Just multiply by twelve. That's a one point two percent annualized inflation rate. 1.2%, that's what they're worried about? And by the way, wage data came out and the wage inflation always should be higher than the price inflation because of productivity growth, right? If, if we had no, way, no price inflation, I'd still expect wages to go up about a percent and a half a year because of productivity growth, right? Well, when you net productivity growth out of the month over month numbers for the last several months, you're coming in at one and a half to 2% inflation. I have no idea what they're worried about at the Fed. None. So do they raise in May? Well, the, the impossibility is to predict people that you don't understand what they're doing. And I'm not trying to be evasive. I would like to, I thought. You, one, use, the, you use the example of when you got spanked that you'd get one or two for good measure. And I think they're in the good measure business. My, I didn't get spanked. My brother got spanked. I, I was well behaved. So no, but you know what I mean. You know, kind of, and then that to grow on that kind of crazy stuff that people used to do. Um, they're in the dishing out punishment to show they can dish out punishment to show that they're righteous. Um, and you think they have to cut in August? They should have cut in uh, December. You're going to look back but, and say they should have cut. Regardless of how irrational they are, your prediction is that they cut in August. Yeah, something like that. They can't fly in the face of reality. Think about it. a month ago or a little over. They, 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 they raised the rate at the same moment they're saying all deposits are insured. So they're so, so worried about the effects of, the, uh, of, of rate increases on the banking system that they say all the bank deposits are insured, okay? And by the way, we're raising the rates 25 basis points to make sure anybody who's got assets held in portfolio, they're worth less. And by the way, since they're worth less, we're gonna lend to you if they're of a certain quality at full face. That's crazy. I mean, I, I, sometimes you have to call things as you see them. And I, I try to be nice. I try to understand them, but I can't. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll anticipate a question that 
that a friend asked me the other day. He says, well, you know, I read your stuff and I hear you and I get you and I understand you know how to read data. Like I know how to take one tenth of a percent and multiply by 12. That's what a PhD got me, by the way, is I could take one tenth of a percent and multiply by 12. And this is, but I don't understand then how can the Fed be so wrong? Right. And I, and I very seriously, this is not meant to be political. So I'll take two examples. Some of you may be old enough to remember Watergate. The Republicans were in, they had all these bright guys and they had all these people and so forth and so on. And they tried to cover up stuff in an election that was going to be a landslide anyway in their favor. All right. How is that possible with smart people? Yet it happened. Okay. And I'll come to the current administration. It was just so you can say I did a Democrat and Republican, which is I'm sure there are a lot of smart people who analyzed the Afghanistan situation and, and thought a lot about how to get out. And you saw how it turned out when we left. I'm not saying I know how to do it better. That's not the point. But it was a complete disaster. It wasn't because they aren't intelligent. It's not because they didn't go to good universities. It's because they got it really wrong. And it happens. And it happens very often. You think the Nixon administration and on, on, on the Watergate and the Afghan situation with uh, Biden are the only times it happens. It happens all the time. But so on that, if we're going to bank on stupidity um, and you say that the Fed starts cutting in August, one of the things you have long been a proponent of for yeah. as long as I've known you and well before you and I became friends is buy an asset, put fixed rate debt on it. And if the fixed rate debt works at the time of acquisition, it's going to work for you over the long term. Yeah. And so anyone who followed that advice during this entire past cycle is doing really well right now in an asset that's probably producing a lot of cash flow and has fixed rate debt and is doing really well because they've got cheap fixed rate debt. And you can tell who they are because they're the ones still smiling. Correct. But you're right now you are saying that if you go out and buy an asset, put a floater on it, bake into your model 100 basis points of additional interest expense because the whatever your cost further are, right, further might interest rate, further interest rate, rate. rate but then you're going to have the opportunity to refinance it with a fixed rate loan within two years at 100 to 150 basis points below where we are today correct, correct. and you believe the forward curve in other words i well yeah i believe the curve i believe rationality um i don't believe that i'll be precisely right. I believe I'll certainly be directionally right. I remember in a directional sense, remember a couple of years, a year and a half ago, you asked me about oil. Yeah. And I said, it's going to be below 80. And I, it's not like I had some sophisticated you know, algorithm and so forth. This is the obvious, right? And I don't know if it's going to be 72 or 81, but you know, this is below that. 100 by a, bit, by a bunch. But by a bunch. I probably said below 100 by a bunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is that same sort of directionality. Uh, why? Because you're seeing these really low inflation rates. You're seeing these really low wage growth. By the way, why is wage growth slowing? It's real slowing because we're adding a lot of jobs. And as we've gotten people back, job openings start falling back towards normal. They're still above normal. And gee, supply and demand. And so demand is, but supply is. And of course, so I believe it. And your point is, I believe it so much that it's contrary to all my instincts, Right, all my instincts. And so on that, in you also do a really interesting analysis as it relates to is now a good time to buy. So you went back and looked at past crises, 82, right. 91, 02, 09. And so you put in the NAREIT and the NECREF returns, which you've done for quite some time on three years, seven years, and 10 years. Right. And what's really interesting about that is that you do it on a running average, which really shows you hold for the long term. You get to 10 years. Not only are you in very positive returns at any hold period, and never but you have never have a negative quarter. Correct. Whereas if you hold for a shorter period of time on a three-year, not only are the returns lower, but you also have plenty of down quarters where if you happen to have sold during that quarter, you had a loss. And that was the deal, right? The deal is you get some Bigger ups, right? But some unpleasant downs, and and, and so, it's the hold period, not the real estate, is sort of the message, right? It's the the point is you're pretty much good enough on the real estate side, but you may not be really good enough on the hold side. And the more time you give yourself, your real estate ability dominates the hold problem, if you will. But over in, in that analysis, not looking at those low points, 
generally speaking, asset by asset, office, retail, yeah. industrial, multi. Multi is the best. I think over a 10 year hold on average over that period of time, it was like a 9.8% return. That's my memory. And on the low Annual end of it, on yeah. the low end of it is office at like seven or seven, two. So Not a huge disparity of returns, huge, but right. look, no, 200 basis points. No, no, I'll take point. it. Yeah. But on the stressed one, the mar the returns go through the roof. Yeah. So talk about that for a second. Well, it's it's pretty. It makes sense. It's pretty simple. Um, just so you know, the only reason I use NACREF and NARED is because it's there, right? It's not data I created. I don't think it's perfectly correct, but it's kind of correct and it's consistent. And what it shows basically is if you have capital and courage, when People don't have either, and you can hold, you're going to do well. It's that simple. If you're in real estate and you have capital and courage when others don't, you're going to do well. You may not do well the next day, you may not do well the next even three years, but you're going to do well. Now, in particular, you did do well in the three year in yeah. these, right? But not three days, right? And so if you have capital and courage when others don't, it's not a surprise that you do particularly well in those periods. And it's it's a little like, um, you know, if if Joel Embiid had to go out of the game because of a, you know, he, he twisted his ankle in there inspecting it, make hay while the sun shines, right? That's when you really have to try to run up some points if you're the opposition and, and so forth. Well, it's kind of the same in real estate, investing in general. Yep. It's a hard business. It's a hard business. And if you have courage and capital, when others don't, it's a real asset is what the studies show. And we just went back and took the, I think everybody would agree the times we took were the stress periods. Yeah, we didn't do anything definitely. funny that way. Um, and it says, it really says something interesting, which is that average return you said was kind of a little disproportionately driven by those, you had to have capital and courage moments. Uh, some people have capital, but not courage. Some have courage, but not capital. You need both. And um, if you miss out on the periods of... You can still have fine returns. You can still do that's fine. That's what your analysis that's, shows. That's the point. You yeah. still do fine, but not quite as fine. And I just think it's... Um, yeah. I, I And so, it's... And by the way, it's very... It's like... I, I played football very badly in college and the coaches used to tell me, you know, there'd be a 270 pound guy coming to uh, with a running start to hit me. And I would be a little smaller than this size. I was a little quicker than I am now, but, and they say, all you have to do is get down low. Well, that's great in theory, but when the 270 pounds hits, that's really hard. So all I'm telling you is you have to have capital and courage and patience. Okay. And so it'll all be fine. Let's let's focus for a moment on the banking crisis and the the SVB sovereign bank uh, failures. Um, one of the data points that's been running around for the last week, it was announced last Friday by the Fed, was over the previous two weeks, bank lending in the United States had gone down by 110 billion dollars, right. and the previous week, banks had borrowed 160 billion from the window. Right. And so there's this big drive towards liquidity. There is no new liquidity going out into the market. A, does that impact the Fed's actions in May? And then B, let's dive into for a moment what the impact on the commercial real estate industry yeah, is going to be. There are a couple of interesting things about what happened there. Um, one is we had unwound $600 billion roughly of the Fed's balance sheet. And in a matter of like eight days, we rewound half of that. Right. Right. That... Uh, so the we got a quick burst of QE, really quick, intense burst. That's one. Second is lots of money has gone out of banks into money market funds uh, with the notion, pr presumably the notion is they mostly hold treasuries and blah, blah, blah in short term, and I'm not so exposed, and I don't have to worry about limits. And presumably, if there ever was a run on a money market, Somehow, if it was big enough, the Fed would be there to back it, even though they have no legal requirement. That's been a big change. Third is uh, banks just froze, right. just froze. Now, the regionals were not where the big reserves were. You know, I always talked about the big reserves. The big reserves were always at the money center banks because that's, that's when the Fed exercised QE. They were buying 
Ginny's, Fanny's, Freddie's, um, some other high quality paper at different times. They weren't buying what regional banks had, like a line of credit on a hot dog stand, right? They weren't buying that stuff when they were doing QE. So, and that's what the regionals disproportionately held, right? Was or commercial real estate. They weren't so much buying the so the the big reserves were and are still held at the big banks, big money center banks. The regionals are thinner. Um, what is its implication on real estate? Well, one of the implications clearly is I have no idea what the bank regulators are doing. I have none, right? Think about, because SVB- I can tell you one thing, they're going to regulate more. And that's where I was leading up to. If you look at SVB, the typical bank regulator problem has been banks have loans to a real estate development that's halfway done. They have a loan to a hot dog stand. They have a loan to somebody who's got a fitness salon, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how the hell do you expect bank regulators to value those? And so when things go bad, they don't know how to value them and it's hard to value, right? SVB had three to five year treasuries, three to five year treasuries. And by the way, they're, they're valued every minute. And here's a bank regulation network that's sitting in their offices and presumably took bond financing. You know, like one of the first things you learned in your economics course was interest rates up, fixed income down. These are transfer, and, and they didn't act. Give me a break. And so you go, oh my God. So what will happen is overreaction. And that's going to be largely taken out of the skin of not three to five year treasuries. It's going to be taken out of the line of credit for a hot dog stand. It's going to be taken out of a, a construction loan, et cetera, because they're going to strike out at everything. And so it will get tougher for the hot dog stand owner and for commercial real estate and development. Now, what that'll mean for commercial real estate is it's going to be a tough next year or so for developers independent of everything else because of that environment. It'll be a better period than expected if you own real estate, especially if you already have fixed rate debt on it, because that supply pipeline is going to get a little thinner than you thought it might be a year and two years from now. Um, yeah, it, it has that implication. They're going to take it out on the wrong people, though. I mean, this is that's one of the that's nature, right? The nature is you you used to get punished as a class because one kid did, did something, but I, I don't want to crucify that kid, so I have to punish everybody to show them. That's what's going to happen. So a, a couple of things on that, and then I want to I want to go to office and liquidity for office. But um, so there's 4.4 trillion dollars of commercial real estate loans outstanding across all lending sources, CMBS, life insurance companies, banks. Um, about um, half of that is non-multi, so office retail. So you've got about 2.1, 2.2 trillion of commercial. The rest is multi to get to your 4.4. Um, banks hold about 40% of total outstandings on commercial. And so one of the things that we've been looking at at Walker and Dunlop is the following. If you've got a $4.4 trillion total outstandings and banks hold 40% of it, to Peter's point, if banks pull back, let's just say for kick's sake, five to 10%, yeah, yeah, not which big. I think is way too conservative given what you right. just said as it relates to regulation, right. okay? But if banks pull back from holding 40% and they go back to 35 or 40 or, or 30% right. of it, you're you're talking about 400 to, you know, 200 to 400 billion dollars of lending that has to be, has to come from other capital right. sources. And so whether that's private capital, whether the CMBS markets come back, what have you, this is a serious shift in the marketplace. Yeah. And it could be one of those moments you look back on, um, at least for several years, that changed the template of lending. And remember, one of the things I've said, and research showed, my research shows, is that real estate values are about capital flows. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Capital flows, capital flows. And by the way, this episode in the last six, eight months has proven that, is that if you reduce the capital flows as much as the capital flows have been reduced, and we've seen it in other times, we saw it in other times without interest rates going up, by the way. We saw it in other times when the interest rates went down 
the same reduction of capital flows and we saw it in real estate pricing. We're seeing it again that when capital doesn't flow, real estate pricing su suffers. And it'll probably suffer a little more because of, I just think you're going to get this banking. I don't think they'll go as far as Elizabeth Warren would want, but it's just a human reaction they're going to have. To, and so you're going to have less capital flowing. And let's but take your number. I think that's why I would actually, your point about cap rates actually going down, because you think in the back half of this year, bank capital starts to flow back to commercial real estate. And from what we're seeing right now, that ain't going to happen. Isn't, yeah. Which and means that that's cap rates a close, continue to expand. View, that's a close call. Prior to SVB, I thought it was a pretty easy call. Now, 100%. I think now when I say the end of the year, but I was saying like the third, late third and fourth quarter, I thought that was a reasonably easy call with SVB and the reactions associated with it, regulatory wise, whether they're good or bad reactions. I think that's a close call, whether we see a reversal by the end of the year, we still have a lot of money out there, but the money will be a little more careful, a little more expensive. And the ones that are going to get hit are less so who JP lends to, right, well, which that. are big companies, big projects, big this, big that, certainly less so those that fin Fannie and Freddie lend to, right? And the ones that the in big insurance companies lend to. It's going to be more America yeah. and not just America, real estate, um, America, the hot dog person with a line of credit, you know, I, I include in that. That's who's going to feel the pain, even though they weren't the ones that created the problem. Yeah. I think this capital flow issue is a, is a huge one and where that capital comes from and who raises the private capital to meet the need. The one other data point, 4.4 trillion of commercial real estate outstanding, 40% um, of that sitting on bank balance sheets. There's another half a trillion that's in land loans and development loans right. on top of that. So that one is one where if you're sitting there and you go to try and get a new loan to go build something and there's a banker sitting there saying, I need liquidity because the regulator is breathing down my throat and down my neck and wants me to have liquidity on my balance sheet. Am I going to extend a three-year construction loan? Right now, I think the answer to that is no. And it, the only, and by the way, take the office, you could add office to that, which is I've got an office building that's 60% occupied and my loan comes due. And I'm not going to put money into it. It's, it's one thing if I'm 95% occupied and I have a 30% loan. But if I'm 75 or I thought I was 75% and my loan is due, I'm not going to put the good news money in. Um, and, and so I look at the bank and say, it's yours. And they're going to look back at me and say, I don't think so. And well, that's that's the other thing. So here in Philadelphia, fifteen hundred Market Street was went into special servicing a year ago in August, um, and everyone saw that. that happen. We sold that. People, you, you know, sold that years ago. No, well, that was Equity Commonwealth that sold that, and people thought Sam was uh, Sam Zell was a little nuts getting rid of all these great assets. And well, it it went to special in August, and then the next one was uh, the Wells Fargo Center in Denver, which went to special, and then there was the Brookfield defaults on two office towers in LA, and now all of a sudden the Wall Street Journal seems to be covering every single office building default, right. front page news that the end is coming for office. Um, the the You put some really interesting data in the letter as it relates to Castle Systems on back to office, and right. you have said, once we get to 60% office occupancy, we're going to get to a tipping point. Right. If you're not in the office, you're going to miss that promotion, you miss that job. The data that you put forth, and I think the interesting clarifier this quarter that I read, and it kind of took my breath away, was that you're very clear this quarter in saying, pre-COVID, this number was 100%. In other words, these are yeah. key fob swipes at 100%. Right. Right. That dropped to 14% right. in April of 2020. And we're now back at 49. Yeah. So I think the, the clarification that I want to say here is in the past, when I read that 49 or 45 number, I was thinking, oh, well, only 60% of the people were actually in the office pre-pandemic. No, Not no, so. no, 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 it's 100% fobs, fobs. fobs. And so we're still begrudgingly at 49. You've got some Texas, Florida have 60, 70% occupancy. Yeah. San Jose, California is the worst MSA covered by the castle sub at 40%. Okay. Do you so still me, have conviction that people Yeah, I back? do. And I'm, I'll give you, put aside the sociological and psychological. So I was just down in Cayman last week, okay? Um, people are coming in five days a week. Five days a week, they're 98%. Now, how is Cayman different than us? 
I mean, by the way, I was talking to somebody over in Tokyo. They're basically at 97%. I don't think they're that different than us. People say, oh, it's because the commute must be easier in Cayman. And only somebody who hadn't done the commute knows would say that. The commute is easier in Cayman than it is in Philadelphia. Is adoption of Zoom and Microsoft Teams greater in the United States than it is in other developed nations? Not notably. In this regard, no, no. And you go, um, by the way, anybody who believes it's about the commute, then Tokyo should never come back, right? If you've ever been part of a Tokyo commute, they would never come back. By the way, France is running up in the 80%, Paris, when I say right. France. London is running up in the 80, 85%. Germany is running so as far as what's the up. catalyst? Is it that just CEOs like Jamie Dimon say, you know what? I've had I'm going to require people back in. Yeah, and they, and then, but then- they, because they now have the leverage to say it? Yeah, it's just that simple. I made a comment. I didn't mean this in a nasty way. I, by the way, I almost mean anything I ever write, I, I never mean nasty. I, I, have a, I mean that seriously. But I, I wrote, a, a, what, three issues ago. I something. think Jerome Powell would take issue with you. Well, saying that the, but I don't mean this nasty. On his canaries this quarter, okay? Well, maybe I'm there, now. There, maybe. there are maybe. 50 different canaries in the coal mine if you read the report. And he puts out... There are five canaries, and if one of them's dead, you got a little bit of a problem. Two is dead more, and you can get the picture here. Where if you've got five canaries out there, you've got a real problem. This quarter, the, of the forty-five, which says overbuilding in commercial real estate, PE, stupid deals, et cetera, et cetera, things that Peter's tracked as far as precursors to trouble, he's got five dead canaries across forty-five. So really, no big insights as far as problems coming on the horizon on real economic indicators. But as he has done in the past, he adds one at the very bottom, which is, and he doesn't say this in the report, I'm going to use my own words on this. Yeah. He's got four dead canaries and one alive canary. Yeah. I think Jerome Powell would take that, that as might a little be, bit for That might be. You know, but I, I wrote a couple issues ago that CEOs earn your pay. There's a reason you're getting paid the big money, right? Earn your pay. And by the way, the real estate industry has actually been quite good about this. You know, the real, most of the real estate companies had their people back quite early. People weren't dying. Well, they have a vested right? interest in it. Well, they do, but the pe people came. They lost some people. And guess what? They pretty much replaced them. They found, by and large, the people they lost tended to be relatively weak performers. They were the people who were probably going to leave them for other reasons, most likely. And I say, look, you're being paid $20 million. You tell me privately that you believe the company is much more productive and much more profitable when people are there. You tell me that privately. And then in spite of your $20 million, you wimp around and don't bring them back for your shareholders. So talking about somebody who you point this out in the letter that Ken Griffin yeah. and his returns at Citadel have been off the charts. And one of the things that Ken Griffin has said by his returns being off the charts is that he got his team back in early and that for 21 and 22 returns, they beat everyone because their team was together. I would put one little note on that. Many of you may have seen it. Ken Griffin made a $300 million donation to Harvard University yesterday, and they just renamed the College of Arts and Sciences, the Ken Griffin College of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. So I guess He's not only putting his, you know, his 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 uh, his actions behind his words, but he's also made enough money to be able to write a gift to others. I mean, there, I I think he's probably accurate. I'm not saying he would have had a bad year, and I don't think he was intimating he would have had a bad year, but he wouldn't have had that year was what he was saying, and and I really mean it when I say earn your pay. You expect the people who are delivering packages for you to earn their pay. Well, I. Then, then CEO, earn your pay and get people back. And the only way you shouldn't say come back is if you really believe it's less productive and profitable, less profitable. And that is not what I've heard from most executives I've spoken to in private, right. in private, right? And the, you can come up with a couple of exceptions. Yeah. I'm not saying all of them. So I think people have to do that. Office has got in this country... The problem that people are slow to come back, I think our executives are less, what, imperial, that certainly than a Japanese executive or something in that regard. Um, so they're less want, they want to be touchy-feely and I want to be nice and so forth. Um, I don't think Japanese executives spend a lot of time worrying about that. I don't think Mexican executives spend, a, I'm not saying they're callous, but 
we're much more enlightened. Um, <laughs> Uh, if I if there was an accentuation in that, it was intended. Um, but the problem office has, if you think about it, is the economy has added jobs net versus pre-COVID. And in a period when the economy has net added jobs, office has fallen apart. Right. Right. It's not that office had trouble when we were in early COVID and nobody was there, that's what do you expect, right? right. The, the disturbing part is even as we've net added jobs, it's still weak. I, I just don't think we're that different than most people. But that's a really, that's a good segue to this next one because I think it's 36 of the 49 markets that you cover have replaced all the jobs they lost in COVID. Yeah. The strongest are Austin, Dallas, and Salt Lake City. And yet, and yet, Austin and Dallas are two of the weakest office markets. So they've added, That's the they've point. added That's employment, exactly the yet point. they're two yeah. of the weakest office markets in the country. And a lot of it is because tech companies went, took lots of space, and then right. have backed out of those office leases. Right. And that, that's, that's to the point. The disturbing thing is, or the concerning thing is, in spite of job growth and these strong markets, especially, it's disturbing to see a lot of job growth and not a lot of office demand growth. That's the that's the disturbing. Because then you say, well, what happens when the decline comes? You, you, you suspect it'll still occur. Um, yeah, office has got a challenge. And, and on the capital side, there's not a lot of courage that I've seen. And there's 80 billion of office debt that needs to be refinanced in 2023. So you haven't got a lot of conviction or courage the people who believe in office yeah. like owen thomas right but, I, I think owen really believes so well he not only believes but he's also got a class buildings where people actually right. want to be so right. his read has he's got beat up less properties, than others just if you don't know and and owen i put aside selling his book i think owen really believes oh, right sure. right and i think he has good reason but to so believe. do the people at sl green and so do the All people of them, at, right? at, at vernado but they've got a little bit Doug trickier said, situation right. because they got b's and c's and not a's but the but the problem is they've already got a lot of exposure to office. So they're unlikely to double down. They got a lot of exposure. And the people who don't have exposure to office are all right now going, thank God, thank right. God. And so it's not like you've got this obvious source of money looking to come in and capitalize. Now, it'll come eventually. It'll come. The question is at what price? But so far, you don't have any control. It's a little like, uh, what, 90, 91? Uh, um, uh, you know, there were papers being written. We'd need uh, no new office buildings for 20 years. That turned out that to be back. wrong. But, uh, but nonetheless, it's in a difficult place in this country. It's, but I got to tell you, I was knocked out down in Cayman. Now, granted, it's a small little market, but you go, their absorption unchanged. Unchanged, people are showing up, no, 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 no effect at all. So let's go to the U.S. consumer for a moment and then mm -hmm. go to housing after that, because I think that's that leads nicely into it. So we've got, you know, what, 36 of 49 MSAs back with all the jobs that they lost during the pandemic. Um, and then you've also got household uh, net worth where it is down year on year by about 9.2%, and yet it's up 9.2% from pre-COVID pre -COVID. levels. Which, so, that's real. That's real. That's, that's real. Job. So, you know, it's 3% a year. Not not stunning, but not so bad to have a 3% real a year. And the, the thing that I look at every quarter is your household debt service ratio. Yeah. So talk for a moment about that, because I think right now with rising interest rates, Everyone's sitting there going, is the consumer going to tip as it relates to mortgage cost, credit card yeah. debt, et cetera, et cetera? So what people, and I think the Fed hasn't figured out, but I don't think people have figured out the consumer. Okay, you want to do real simple? I'll give you real simple math. You can do this more complicated. Two thirds of Americans own their home. Okay, everybody got that? that that's basically right. And of those, about two thirds have a mortgage. Okay, that and the others have no mortgage. Okay, two thirds have a mortgage. I'm just making this very simple. Um, that means that around 42 percent of all Americans have a mortgage, and they had a mortgage, by the way, by the middle of 2002. 
Fair enough? Okay, so like 42% of the American population had a mortgage by the middle of 2002. Everybody in America refinanced when rates were low. That means 42% of American households have mortgages that are locked in for 30 years at around 2%. And it could be a little higher than two. It depends when they actually struck their mortgage versus a norm that you would have expected of about 4.5%. That means 42% of Americans have four to five thousand dollars more spending power than is their historical norm. And to put that in context, that's on a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage. That's the average, literally, that's the average mortgage in the country. Obviously, it's higher for some people, lower for others. Um, four to five thousand dollars for two for for forty two percent of American households, and median income for households is like 68,000, that's real money. So I looked up and I, what a two week vacation for a family of four, that's it. And I just only looked that up as an indication of purchasing power, that's all I did it as. And not only can they do that for one year, they can do that for 30 years. They can get an extra two week vacation for 30 years. That's in the economy. That's long COVID. That's an after effect, right? And by the way, it has another side to it, which Willie has pointed out, which is, okay, that's the good news coming through the economy. That's a huge good news coming through the economy. The flip is, I'm not selling you my home. I'm not going to sell you my home. Because if I sell you my home, I give up four to $5,000 a year that I locked in now, will I ever sell it? Of course. I'm not going to sit, you know, I have one child now and I, I get, I'm going to get two promotions and two more kids. Okay, I'm going to get a bigger home, but I'm going to get it a year or two later. Yeah. So the housing market is going to be tight on the resale side. And you can do a present value calculation, right, of four to 5,000 a year, expected value, 40,000, some number like that. 30,000 on a $350,000 home. That's and so huge. It's massive. Huge, huge. On somebody with on somebody with a $68,000 or 70,000 income. Huge. So what you're going to see in the single family, you're already seeing it somewhat is I'm not selling. Uh unless you really hit a high price. I'm perfectly happy to sit here. So yeah. I, want to, I want to segue that into housing and undersupply on single family. But before we do that, I want to finish up on the consumer. So the consumer uh, income to debt burden has dropped to almost a 40-year low right now. Right. So And that's one and of that's, the major points. That's, that's, one of the, major the, that's in there. the big right. part of the point. Right. So there's also, you, you, you take a good focus on student debt. Hmm. And um, one thing you point out is that the student debt forgiveness that came in place during the pandemic expires on June 30th, 2023. Right. So just as a point, all the people who had student debt that the federal government said, you've got a, a vacation, you don't have to pay it, and you're not in default, and you're not going to have accrued interest on it, just take some time off during the pandemic, and then we'll start back up. It starts June 30th. Mm -hmm. That could have a big impact, as Peter points out in the letter, on that younger demographic going back and getting a new job, that right. some of those people who might be on the sidelines might get back into the game right. now that that is back uh, as a burden for right. them. But there's one other point I wanted to make on this, which you point out, which is that since 1999, when the federal government really stepped into the student loan program, the, the federal government has lost $170 billion on student loans. And by the way, we and, know it's higher than that because that was like six months ago. Okay. Right. So, so $170 yeah. billion. In context, I looked at this last night and I had to do this. The federal government spent $191 billion bailing out Fannie and Freddie. Yeah. Subsequently, have gotten back all $191 billion and have made an, another $100 billion. So Fannie and Freddie have returned $100 billion of excess capital to the federal government since getting bailed out for $191 right. billion. Right. The new student loan forgiveness plan proposed by the Biden administration, which you point out is being challenged in the courts right now, could cost us another half a trillion dollars. Right. So there's this big, there's there's both the federal debt on it, but right. then there's also the fact that the forgiveness program 
if you will, not the forgiveness program, but the moratorium of having to pay your student loans right. expires at the end of June. Do you think that has a big impact? On could the have. I don't think it would have a big, but it would have an impact. Um, the irony is that when the new student loan, loan program was introduced, the Congressional Budget Office uh, did a study, and it was going to be a great cash flow to the U.S. government right. every year. Not so much. Right. So, and it, not so much. Yeah. Not so much. So, so much for studies. I mean, I'm wrong sometimes, too. Um, <laughs> I hate to say that while my wife is here, but, you know, I think she... She sometimes thinks that I try to convince her otherwise. But, you know, you talk about a miss, yeah, right? A big, big miss. miss. It will have an impact. The reason I don't think it will have a staggering impact is um, in the big scheme of things, it's small money. Right. It's, in 18.7 of net, net de it, uh, federal it, deficit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that federal it, debt. So it, on that, let's just go to that for two seconds. You put in you, the, one of the things you talked about there was previously was the Fed and the fact that the Fed had shrunk their balance sheet by six hundred billion dollars, and now all of a sudden turned around and over one weekend took back three hundred billion of that. Right. But you also point out in the letter that a lot of this is, if you will, intergovernmental payments. Right. And so while the the federal debt is now at forty trillion dollars, you go through and talk about, right. if you will, intercompany loans where right. we're borrowing from one and paying the Fed back. So it's just cycling those. Yeah, and so you get it, to an actual net debt number of I think eighteen point seven trillion. Well, it's you get if you the federal government has one branch of the government, the Treasury that owns owes money to other branches of the government. But if they sent payments on that debt from one branch to the other, it's still inside the federal government, right? That's pretty simple. No different than your inner company debt. And and so if you first you have to net that out, right? Because if they paid it off, they'd have to, you know, it's a net wash. Then you say the Fed. Now technically the Fed is an independent branch of the federal government. However, all the money they make or lose is flows to the US government. So that's a branch of the US government. It's a technicality uh, that it's not. Okay. So you'd net that out. You then say, well, then we have debt we owe ourselves as U.S. citizens and debt we owe to foreigners. That's about the $16, $17 trillion net debt that is owed by the U.S. government to U.S. citizens or foreign citizens. And of that, um, I think it's seven or eight trillion, I can't remember which, is owed to foreigners. Right. Okay, And the rest we owe to ourselves. And one of the reasons Japan has coped so well with their debt situation is they all owe it to themselves. So if tomorrow Japan paid off, if I taxed everybody in Japan to pay off all the Japanese debt. They're paying themselves. They're paying themselves. Now, not necessarily the same individual. Right. Right. But the money wouldn't be gone. It would just be a bit redistributed. That, so the, now if we pay off foreigners, that's gone, right? And that's what I would call the unambiguous debt. The funny thing about the unambiguous debt, that, that which we owe the foreigners, it hasn't risen much during all this. And so on that, A, and I know you're a, an economist and not a political scientist, but do you think we have an issue as far as the debt ceiling? Just real quick. I don't think we well, might have spent a lot of time on that. No, you think we get through it? Of course. I mean, okay. the debt and then, ceiling and is then, And then do you think that this as we have Bitcoin trading at $30,000 a coin, yeah. okay, which defies all logic in my world. Do you think that this move by the, by the, 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 uh, um, what are they called? The, you know, Russia, China, the, the, um, what was the term that they used for them? Not the bricks. Like, the bricks. The bricks. Yeah. Do you think them moving to try and have their own currency is a real threat to the- You have to have an alternative. I mean, how many of you are thrilled to hold the Russian ruble? <laughs> no, but if they created a common currency. Okay, but part of the common currency is going to be Russian rubles. How many of you <laughs> okay. are thrilled with that? We don't that? need to go into that much. China. That's Peter's it's point a, on that. A, don't worry. It's not an issue. Alternative, right? Okay. So on housing, we're undersupplied by 3 million single family homes on the multi side. Um, as far as the deliveries, we're actually getting quite close to being at, 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 at mark, if you will. Um, you spent a bunch of time talking about housing affordability and rents. And I think two of the data points that you put in there is both the HUD 40% um, right. a number as well as the Wells Fargo Home Affordability Index. The thing that shocked me on the Home Affordability Index is that the Home Affordability Index, Wells Fargo's Home Affordability Index, 
only 38% of median income people in the United States, median income people can afford a new or existing home. 38. That can is, afford the median new or existing new home. New existing home. Right. That, that has averaged 61% right. and got to a high of 78% in 2012. Right. Right. I mean, so the, the to our point about people not wanting to give up on that single family mortgage, right. people are going to hold on to the stock. And unless there's a big supply of new stock, the cost of housing is just going to continue yeah. to go I up mean, and be less and less affordable for middle America. We, we've underproduced. It's that simple. Now, that if you underproduce something, it doesn't mean at every moment in time there's an upward pressure. I mean, on Christmas, people didn't go out and shop for six hours, right? There was no upward pressure on prices then. But when you underproduce, there's an upward pressure over time. Housing has got that. And it's really got that in single family, which spills over and creates it in multi, especially when you put it, I'm not going to sell my home because I've got the $4,000 a year. So you've got a lot of multifamily kind of good there. Um, not doesn't overcome everything. But yeah, I think that looks pretty well. Um, and you like multi generally? I like multi generally because for a couple of reasons. One, three. One, the data kind of shows over a long, long term, it's it does a bit problem. better. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. And and there must be something there if it's over a long, long term. That like you can like Fannie and Freddie. Right. And Fannie and Freddie are a part of that. There's no doubt. In a capital intensive industry, having additional sources of capital is good. Trust me, there's no shopping center owner who wouldn't love it if Freddie and Fannie also lent against shopping centers, yep. right? Or offices or whatever, okay? So that's one. Uh, second, I like it because no individual can swing me from positive cash flow to negative cash flow. No one, right? In, in an, I can have an office building where one tenant swings me from positive to negative. Even if the market's pretty good, one tenant can do. Even in a warehouse that can happen, less so in good retail, but it can happen. So I like the the the, the, the what the fragmentation of the demand, if yeah. you will. I like that. Um, and the third is, it's not so true of the high rise multi, but of the more garden suburban stuff, you can pause pretty easily, much more easily than you can a lot of other product types. So yes, it gets, it's one of the great things industrial has going for it is you can kind of pause it more easily. And so supply and demand don't get quite as out of balance. And then, but you know, having Freddie and Fannie there, you don't think the guys in office would love to have Freddie and Fannie there right now? So as far as markets you like in your research because of occupancy rates, you actually, you think that, um, uh, uh, vacancy rates and multi go down in Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Dallas, which Dallas makes sense. I didn't get Cincy and Cleveland, but we'll, we'll, we'll pause on that for a second. And you really don't like Jacksonville and Denver. You see a lot of supply. significant supply so coming on in both you Jacksonville. You know, my first time I went to ULI, I didn't get it because I didn't grow up in real estate. I grew up in business, you know, like water heaters and bags and the folk paper bags and such. And the focus was always on demand and supply. And then I went to ULI the first time in 1985, and everybody would talk as if it was unambiguous that if you had high demand growth, it would be good. Well, it's not good if I have high demand growth and faster supply growth, right? And that's the challenge is which is which. So right now, you have several markets where, of course, you like the demand, but the supply is faster. Yep. And so you look at a market like Cleveland, Am I excited about the demand side of Cleveland or Cincinnati? I mean, you can get excited about a micro market, right? But in general, am I? If LeBron's son goes to play at Ohio State, you might get excited. If you, about Columbus, Columbus will do great. You might get right? excited about Columbus. But am I, you know, am I as excited about the demand side of Cincinnati or a Cleveland as I am about the demand side of a Denver? Of right. course not. Right. What am I liking? Which is there's basically no supply. And so if I get any demand growth, which those markets in the good sub-markets will get, there's any demand growth and there's not much supply, I'll take that. Right. As opposed to lots of demand growth and maybe even lots plus supply growth in the short. That's 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 simple. And so on retail, you put some stats out there that have retail sales super strong in Q4, um, Q1 retail sales holding up. To your point that you've consistently driven home, 
online sales got up to about 20% of total retail sales during the pandemic or back down about 15% of total retail sales. As they hit trend, they're going to go, there's something there, right? They're going to go up. I like good retail and I like good retail. I've always liked good retail. I even more so like good retail since about, I don't know, the middle of 21. And the reason was, if you'd have asked me, which you did as we talked, uh, not on the webcast, but uh, what do you think about retail in 2019? I'd say, I don't think everything's going to go online, but I didn't know that. I say, I don't think they can do this online effective. Well, by the middle of 21, we saw what cannot be done profitably online. Right. And so now you've got a battle tested, if you will, retail. You know they can't do this. You know they can do that. You can then curate your shopping center, assuming it's in a good location. And so you can curate it to have what they can't do rather than what they might do. They being online. When I and say you that. continue to promote industrial just because it takes for every dollar of, of, of regular retail, it takes four feet of industrial to supply like the three, online. Three, three, three-ish, three yeah. Okay, so you like that. You, you, you go back and look at RevPAR and, and occupancy in hotels, and you basically paint a picture that the hospitality industry is back in 2013. So was 2013 a good time to invest in hospitality? Oh, it was a spectacular time to invest. I mean, as it turned, it, interestingly, there wasn't a lot of courage yet in hospitality in 2013, but it was a great time with hindsight, perfect hindsight to have courage. Um, but that's about where hospitality is back to. Um, again, I, let me give you a real simple picture of where hospitality is at. Um, when you leave, tourists are back. When we live a few blocks from here, when we came out in 2020, there was nobody, like literally no one. 2021, like a handful, certainly no foreigners. 2022, some. Tourists, I mean, just walk outside and see it. And we haven't seen yet the Chinese come back. Now, the Chinese pre-COVID were spending twice as much on international travel as Americans. Twice as much in aggregate, not per person, but yep. in aggregate. They're not back yet. So what happens in, I don't know, this year, next year, as the Chinese come back? And they'll come back. Could they save San Francisco? <sighs> The question, only San Francisco can save San Francisco. It needs to be saved. Um, and hopefully it will be. I mean, it's an amazing infrastructure. It's an amazing kind of place. It's a good example of, um, of how kind of communist systems can destroy things. And I mean, th take, think about this. You don't have to have a PhD. If I tell you, you can steal $900 and no one's going to do anything to you. What do you think is going to happen? This is not hard. And by the way, you can come back later this afternoon and steal $900 more. And you can either use it for yourself or go out and resell it. I mean, this is not hard. I, I think they did it for, quote, good reasons. I mean, noble, if you will, reasons. But Stupid, and <laughs> and and and, uh, but so, it can't be surprising to people. So and so you got to change things like that if you're going to solve. Interesting. So the, most of your Philadelphia people, I think, right? And there are a few, and you saw the headline yesterday in the paper that Philadelphia crime is not up really that much, even though it's up a little, right? Right. But you know why that? Everybody who lives in the city knows why that is which is you're not reporting lots of the crime. Anybody doubt that? Now, we could get into a long discussion about how much, but, you know, so a few, we live in a lovely neighborhood, lovely, and I, 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 I got punched one morning on the street. And fortunately, I'm like Spider-Man. It didn't affect me, right? So, and it was very funny that when I talked to suburbanites, they all said, what did the police do when they got there? Didn't hurt me, to be serious. Didn't hurt me. And all, the, and all suburbanites said, what did the police do when they got there? And what did anybody who lived in the city said? I hope you didn't go after them, right? And of course I didn't. And, and, and did I report it? Of course not. Of course not. 
And I'd lived for almost, what, 40 years we've lived, right? And never got punched. Now, maybe it's because I've gotten old. But, but no, and I, there's that kind of problem. And yeah. these cities have to save themselves. And, and Chicago just made a move to not saving itself. And hopefully I hope, Denver, I and hopefully hope this Denver guy moves. does great. Hopefully, I hope he I do does too. great. And but, look, but Whole Foods just closed another store in Chicago. Right. The Democrats are going there for the convention, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that helps and gives them a shot in the arm. Final thing before we close, because we're right at time, and then we're going to go to Q&A here in the room as when we close off of the webcast. But on a, on a, on a, on a positive note, I think, there's been a lot of talk about the B-REIT and the fact that B-REIT had significant redemption requests in Q4 into Q1. One point, if the B-REIT had been a bank, it wouldn't exist today. Correct because it had the exact same redemptions True. that SBB did. Okay, Correct. it had 40 plus billion dollars of redemptions, but because it has gates, it still exists today. Correct. Okay, but then Blackstone turns around and it's only Blackstone can do, and everyone in the room knows, they just closed on a $30 billion global real estate Correct. fund. Your note is that there are $375 billion of dry powder in global private equity funds looking at commercial real estate. Got to find a home. The data I, data I saw this morning on that Blackstone 30 billion is Blackstone alone with that fund has raised $370 billion of commercial real estate private equity over its entire, That's yeah. this is fund 10. Yeah. This is the largest of all of them, but they've raised $370 billion, just Blackstone. One, one. Yeah. But the point is, there's a lot of dry powder out there, is there Huge not? Huge dry powder. And maybe I'm over, we're all overly affected by our personal experience. I, coincidentally, I was chairman of Rockefeller Center in like 94, 95. And I was trying to sell Rockefeller Center, 6.2 million square feet, Radio City, the Christmas tree, the whole deal. GE was a third of the credit, you know, and that's when GE was a great credit. And I couldn't find anybody who had money. I went around the world, literally trying to find people who had money. And Blackstone had like a $300 million fund. A Goldman had a $600 million fund. Apollo had a $500 million fund. Zelle had, I think, 800. That's it. Yeah. And that was it. Today, that's chump. Ch there were no sovereigns really doing anything back then. That was a foreign. There were rich guys, but there were, you know, today, all of those. If, if I told you somebody has a $300 million fund, you'd say oh, they're doing OK, but you're not impressed. That was it. Like five of them. And so the notion um, I got to know a lot of friends simply because I had to knock on their doors to see if they might be interested in doing it. N not funds, but, but yeah. people. Um, and uh, there's a lot of money out there that's going to have to find a home, going to find a home. And it will ultimately attract debt to it. Um, ultimately. Let's hope. Um, I'm going to close out the webcast on that and then open up for questions here at the uh, Constitution Center. But Peter, thank you very much. It was a great discussion. My pleasure. Always a pleasure to be with you.